ABC just added a new drama to its Sunday lineup titled The Company You Keep, starring Milo Ventimiglia, Katherine Heine Kim, Sarah Wayne Callies, and William Fitchner. It's got magic tricks, sting ops, heists, forbidden love, and good old-fashioned family drama. On this podcast, we like to review the most recent installment of a different series every show. In this case, that's a 45-minute pilot. It's February 23rd, and you're listening to today's episode. Would you rather star in a film with Nick Nolte or no? That's just the answer to whatever the question is. <laughs> I was the other option was being a guest star in a Milo Ventimiglia show. I am probably giving Nick Nolte too hard a time, but he reminds me a little bit of Gary Busey, and that's scary. <laughs> what I don't the, want to spend time. With what if the though. film also had Robert Redford and Susan Sarandon and Shia LaBeouf? It would, would that cool. change your opinion? No, because I, it would Shia LaBeouf. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it'd be cool to get their autograph, I guess. But like again, spending how much time? Six months with people like that? It, that would be it, the geriatric society or? in 2012 a film came out called the company you keep and when i was originally doing research for this show i thought that that cast was going to be for this show and i was confused because i was like i thought robert redford retired from acting but no it ended up being completely different what was that about it's a thriller about some lawyer that identity gets exposed it really has nothing to do with Is this robert redford the lawyer or shia yeah, labeouf no robert redford but what, getting away right off the bat, what was your rating? Did you like this show or not? You want me to give my rating? Okay. Yeah. Uh, that's the ending thing. So it's seven, not too shabby. Okay. So yeah, that was why I was surprised with. Because this was a show that was based off of a Korean drama called My Fellow Citizens. But really, the thing that I was surprised about was that that show, I saw the pilot to, was a complete comedy for like a full hour well tell me about the pilot what happened so we have a con man uh-huh. and like within the first 20 minutes i, I assume this is how does he sh- like magic i uh, know oh does he like magic in this show does he have a father with dementia no okay does he fall in love yes okay. that was in fact well, what, that's korean drama that's what like the last 40 minutes of the show was but the first 20 minutes starts out with him he's like meeting this chairman at least like this kind of mafia boss mm-hmm. and he has this money with him and he wants to get uh, it transferred because it's Venezuelan money. He's trying to get Korean money for it. And when he gives over the money, he gets like over a million dollars in Korean money. And the thing is, is that the chairman has an assistant. We cut to this assistant. He is like getting in all sorts of trouble. He, he's trying to get to the meeting on time, but it seems like there's traffic jams. There's like cars that are running into each other. He even gets hit by a car at one point. And this is also that the main character can get away. And right after the main character gets away, the assistant runs into to the meeting and is like they've changed venezuelan currency he gave you all fake bills or all old bills that we're not going to be able to use did you already exchange the money and the chairman is like yes and that's when we learned that yeah the main character is a con man okay so they knew the venezuelan bill was a venezuela had its big uh what collapse um about what's Eight years ago? Yeah, this this was, I think, a pilot in 2016. So that makes around sense. that time period. All right, well, they're dealing with Bitcoin in the first scene. Okay. Do you want, all right, so this show is organized a little differently. It starts with a heist, then transitions into a meet cute, then goes back to being a heist, then another meet cute, then a sting op, then an apology, and then a cliffhanger. And that's the end of the episode. <laughs> okay. We begin with Milo Ventimiglia, or as I always refer to him, Peter Petrelli, even though I know that his character on Heroes isn't even as big as his one on This Is Us. He is finally shaved, though, and he looks a little bit more like Peter Petrelli from Heroes. But his name in this show is Charlie, and he is in a warehouse. And he is making a deal, kind of like what you were talking about, with the Irish mob for $10 million in Bitcoin. Mm-hmm. This is this was shown in the trailer. Okay. Yeah. And guess who leads the Irish mob? I have no idea. Brendan McGuire, that's his name on the show. Timothy V. Murphy is his name in real life. His name on Sons of Anarchy was Galen O'Shea. Ah, uh, that... yeah, yeah, yeah. And okay. what was his character like on Sons of Anarchy? He was a villain. Well, well yeah, yeah, but like... But like he was he was like a main villain. He uh-huh. was like, I think he was in season four through season six, and I think he had some type of connection with Ron Perlman, Clay, at least. Yes. Um, but yeah. But no. was he like the Irish mob? Yes. As well? Yeah. It yeah. felt like he was reprising a character. <laughs> His number two, though, was spooked by this whole interaction. Uh, her name is Daphne Finch, 
and she doesn't want to get the deal done. So it's a warehouse for 10 million Bitcoin. Uh -huh. And then that's when the helicopters and the sirens and the FBI all show up at once. They're driving in and the Irish mob jumps out. They grab yeah. their Bitcoin cold wallet and they get out of there. And the FBI tackles Charlie and then it's revealed that they're not actually the FBI, they're Charlie's family. And that is like the first episode as well, because I mentioned uh, the car jams and people getting, and like the guy getting hit by a car. And it's revealed that all of the like uh, distractions that stopped the guy from getting to the meeting were actually part of the main character's plan to get like enough time for him to escape. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's, it's going off the same idea. The weird thing about the company you keep, I found was that they were going a lot more of a serious route with it. And usually when you take a comedy series and you go the serious route with it, it doesn't always work, but it seemed like a seven out of 10. That's that's passing. Well, it, it, this is, we're still really early yeah, on. Yeah, right. Uh, this is where we meet the entire family. There's Tina. She's the fiance to Charlie. We have Birdie, Sarah Wayne Callies, or as I like to refer to her, Sarah Tancredi. Again, I'm stuck in the mid 2000s <laughs> television universe because that's her prison break character. But then she went on to be Lori in The Walking Dead. So even a bigger role. Um, but she plays the sister. There's Fran, who's the ma. And there's Leo, who's the pa who I already hinted at has the early stages of dementia. He can't remember his granddaughter's birthday. And uh, he's played by, I said William Fincher, William right? Fincher, no, yeah. that wasn't my dementia joke. Okay. Um, <laughs> and everybody's celebrating because Charlie has stolen the Bitcoin cold wallet and replaced it so that the Irish mob actually ran off with a duplicate. So they actually were able to get the money. In yeah, the this is all gone according to the plan. They were the FBI, so they knew when to come in. So everyone's retiring, they're selling the bar, they're going to Panama or the Caribbean or somewhere, but not so fast. This show loves to pull the rug out from under you. It did it in the first scene when they uh, had the FBI roll in, and now they're doing it here because guess who has betrayed everyone? It's the fiance, Tina, has run off with the money. Why she needs $10 million and she can't just split it between everybody? Like when you said that it was only for $1 million, that made a lot more sense because it's like $1 million someone could burn through. And if you had to split it five different ways, then, then it's like, yeah, you'll steal that money. But with her, I was just, she left her wedding ring behind and it, it was pretty funny. Yeah, but. no, in the show, uh, what happens is the main character, I think like he uh, proposes to his fiance yes. right after the heist. She says yes, and then it's a couple days later, he returns to his apartment, it's completely wiped. He runs out to a balcony where someone is randomly on the phone with someone else. He jacks the phone from that person, hangs up and then calls his wife and his wife is at the airport. And it seems like uh, she's almost like, Shay from Game of Thrones, where she doesn't really have any connection to the main character. She just was kind of saying yes to make him happy. Uh -huh. Like that type of thing. Is, is it similar in this show? Oh, well, I could actually compare it to a few things. Remember in the movie that Matt Damon did a few years ago where he played a really tiny person? Downsizing. Downsizing and his wife calls him from the airport? Yeah. That's what that sounded like. Yeah. But this they do in kind of a more, I would say, subtle fashion. Birdie, Sarah Wayne Cowley's character, is uh, in the bar and she wants the cold wallet to, so that they can actually transfer the money and make sure that everything's set and that's when charlie sticks his hand into his vest uh and finds the wedding ring and that like immediately sends chills over <laughs> everyone and they're like call her call her call her but everyone who's watching knows that this thing is over mm -hmm. that they've lost the money that i don't know if we'll see tina again but it, I, I thought it was it did it so quickly that it like moved the show along really well and you asked me what it reminded me of it reminds me of the supernatural character that lauren cohen played where she keeps on screwing over yeah. the supernatural brothers right mm -hmm. so remember what i said it goes heist and then it goes to a meet cute mm -hmm. so now we meet emma played by katherine heine kim she's part of the cia but she's oh, is that given right away? Yes, right at the start. Because in the show, it takes like a good 50 minutes. Like that's a reveal. So it's like imposters because they wait until the very end to show that someone's a criminal or they... Right. Work for, but in this, no, she works for the CIA. She goes to work. And what does she get? She gets a ping on her phone and her phone is telling her that she needs to run back to some hotel room and find out that her boyfriend is cheating on her. It felt so thrown in, so rushed. It felt like it was just there so that she could be sad. That happens in the original, but there's no like her working on a mission i think it's just her breaking into the apartment and like she was her at the cia doing her job and you'd think the cia would have some protocol about having to leave or work. something like that yeah but no she that. just goes straight over and then she's like how could you cheat on me blah 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 and uh that night she goes down to the bar lobby 
and she starts drinking and feeling sorry for herself, for herself. And we learn that she's really good at reading people because she calls out some married guy for hitting on her in the same way that almost every genius does she, does character. Does she beat him up? No, she okay. doesn't beat him up. In the no. original, that's how we're introduced. Oh. So she's beating someone up at like a nightclub and then transitions to her like breaking into her boyfriend's apartment. Like it was played completely for last. It was one of the funniest parts of the episode. No, this was more like a Sherlock thing where she looked down and she saw the little wedding finger band tan line or whatever. And she like diagnosed that the guy had recently been to Hawaii and that his uh, daughter or son (laughs) had like painted his nails. And then, (laughs) yeah. And so as soon as, yeah, as soon as he leaves, um, Charlie's character is there. I keep on wanting to call him just Milo. But uh, yeah, he's hanging out and they bond over their cynicism of just how bad relationships are. I saw this in the trailer. Is this where they're like, uh, they're like, give me the truth. And then he's like, I'm a criminal. And she says that she's part of the CIA. Yeah, so they bond over lies to start with. They're just lie, lie, lying. And they love each other for it. And then at the end, she's like, yeah, give me a truth. And then they kind of give each other a truth, but don't realize it's the truth. It seems so snarky. Like it came across like it wouldn't it was, be It was like, good. it was trying to show them just it's a meet cute they're falling in love they spend 36 hours together they they go, they go to the pool they eat in their room they have sex they they have drinks okay this is a lot like the pilot yeah yeah so it basically they fall in love all right and so he's ignoring his family's phone calls and she's not doing her work at the cia unclear why it's also strange that this hotel room because he's in like the penthouse and that's where they're hanging out is so empty all the time the bar is empty the pool is empty you'd think that this would have been super expensive for both of them but it doesn't seem to phase them at all and now that that meet cute ends they kind of go their own separate ways and and it's now heist time oh this feels like that's grease (laughs) after after meeting no that actually is i did have that really tiny thought for a second where it was like this summer we're going to spend the love of our life together and then never see each other again that's that's almost exactly what happened have they ever thought to make a grease prequel that showed that 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 summer though (laughs) the summer that they're always talking about (laughs) i think someone needs to pitch that i think it would go over really well well it's funny you say that because that'd probably be a teen show and julia cohen she has a co-executive produced and wrote for a million little things quantico but also riverdale i think it's also ran for degrassi the next generation but yeah i'm sorry to go over that but i think if you pitched it and then you had travolta like okay with a cameo that (laughs) that a studio would actually like green light it even if it was like a television show, they extend a musical Grease prequel to a television oh, show. Oh, God. Okay. All right. So the heist, the meet cute. Now we're back to heist time. Charlie returns to his family's pub. We meet the whole gang again. And uh, Bertie has a daughter who is deaf, but she also loves magic. They all love magic. So William Fitchner's character, Leo, has taught Charlie how to do the sleight of hand trick that he uses in the first scene. But he's also now teaching um, the, the, the I, don't, I don't know if I caught her name, but she's deaf and she's only there in the background so far, but they might be setting up for future seasons, the future generation. I'm joking. Okay. <laughs> I was All right. say, so, so the next heist that they're planning because they need to make some money back because they lost $10 million worth of what they were expected to earn. And uh, the new mission is, I would call it Righteous Gemstones because it deals with this pastor, Evan Earl III, who is a CEO of this mega church named Illuminate Fellowship. And it's actually a big money laundering scheme where they pump money into the church and then he takes a cut and he also donates a bunch to the places to like elevate himself in society. And basically Pastor Earl is just a bad dude. And so they bump into him. And so they, so, they, so they're ripping off kind of the people that are laundering. They're the Robin Hoods. Okay, yeah, I was going to make that comparison. Because even in the first scene, remember, it was with the Irish mob. So right. it's bad people who we find out via Emma's job, the CIA work that she's doing, that they're selling fentanyl. They're a big fentanyl ring in Europe and they're trying to transition and expand into the U.S. Okay, so like basically the company keeper, the people that Charlie works for have like a moral code. Yeah, just like the Now You See Me people. I think they also have a moral code because they only steal from like big banks. I've never seen the movie. (laughs) (laughs) All right, so Pastor Evan Earl, they bump into him, they steal his phone, they clone it, and then they return it to him so he doesn't know because he gets a new phone every week. I guess. And uh, and that's where they find out that he's going to be attending a gala where he'll be meeting his actual contact, the person who is the bad guy, right? Okay. And so they say, we're going to attend that gala. This is where the heist turns back into sort of a meet cute, but it stays like a heist. So they're, they merge. So Emma is actually attending the gala as well. Uh, her dad 
is an ex-governor of the state and her brother is a senator of the state. So uh -huh. her entire family is very wealthy and politically strong. Wait, so the brother is like almost in a higher position, right? Because you said he's a senator and the dad is a governor? Ex-governor. Ex-governor, okay. Yeah. yeah, and I know that they're played by like people who are big, like a big deal who I would recognize, but I didn't click onto them. They're part of the regular cast, but they weren't that big of a deal in this episode. Okay. So Charlie ends up attending the gala with his sister, Birdie, because they're trying to sneak around and find out what the pastor's up to. He bumps into Emma and then they spend the most of the night together. Like just, oh, it's <laughs> you. I love okay. you. Yeah. You know, that type of thing. Yeah. And, uh, and then at the end of the night, though, Birdie gets mad at Charlie because he spent the entire time that he was supposed to be spying on the pastor, just flirting with this girl. And that's when Charlie realizes that he has to put an end to this. And so he dumps Emma, even though he really likes her, and it uh, hurts her. Oh, that is completely different. I mean, like, in the show, in the pilot for the Korean version, they get married. Right then and there? I mean, like, they get married a good 40 minutes into the episode, yeah. <laughs> wow, okay. Um, but does he have a fiancé at the beginning? Yeah, 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 yeah you said yeah. that, too. Huh. Well, they don't end the episode with them not together. Okay. So, it, it, anyway, so the heist ends with the family deciding that they're going to text the pastor. They do see who he ends up meeting with. It doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. And so they end up texting him on that burner phone that they already have control of, saying that his cover has been blown. He has to wrap up all the money that he has, stick it into a briefcase, and the fixer will drive up and take it from him. Okay. And so that's exactly what happens. But the fixer is actually... Uh, Charlie, and they just take the money, the pastor thanks them, and they drive off. Wow, that, that phone really came in handy for them. <laughs> More importantly, the gala had nothing to do with their ending plan. Like, they could have just texted him as soon as they cloned the phone two scenes earlier. Like, <laughs> I don't know, 15 minutes earlier and just ended with uh, him giving them the money. I imagine it was for show though. Like I imagine this this thing looks pretty good because not only is it produced by Ventimiglia's, I think, own production company, but also you have what's John. Venti what's the Ventimiglia production company called? It was founded in 2004 with like his best friend. Oh, I think cool. it's called like Ventimiglia Productions or something close to it. And then you have John M. Chu who directed Crazy Rich Asians and In the Heights as well as everything else. He's a producer for this thing. So And it's also on ABC. So I imagine it looked good as well. ABC shows that there's no guarantee that it's going to look good, especially for a network show. Yeah, but like ABC, especially their dramas, they always try to go with like the stylized version of it. I would say that their costuming is there. Like the gala <laughs> looks pretty cool. But like when it comes to action scenes, we only see, I guess, maybe this is where it comes into the next scene. You get a sting op, right? Mm -hmm. So the CIA and FBI are working together to actually take down the people from the first scene, the Brendan McGuire, uh, the Irish Oh, they're mob. back, okay. Yes, so the CIA have tracked them down. They're still in the US. They're trying to, I guess, get out of the US. He's about to walk to his plane and the FBI have set up this thing where they're watching them. And as soon as Brendan McGuire starts walking to the plane, that's when they all run hustling in. Emma is saying, no, 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 hold back. There's probably someone else. And there is, that's Daphne and she gets away. And we find out that she's actually been the brains of the group, the reason why it's been able to expand so quickly. And she's going to turn into the main villain because Brandon McGuire is going to jail. And Timothy V. Murphy was only there for like a short cameo, I guess. <laughs> um, and so Daphne is on the loose and Emma, while chasing her, gets into a car accident. Um, and so she's a little bit hurt up, beat up. And uh, then the next scene, she's at her house and she's sad. And guess who shows up on his motorcycle? Oh, I'm skipping over a part. So... They get the money, right? Charlie's family does. Yeah. And they start splitting it up. And that's when Charlie's like, okay, you guys can finally take your retirement, talking to his parents. But the parents want everybody to be able to retire. Apparently, Charlie's character had already been to prison for them once. And so they don't want to deal with that again. They want one big heist to just finish it off. And yeah, of one course. more. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's like kaleidoscope a lot of the time. And so his dad gives this compelling speech about how Charlie should go live his life. And that's what Charlie does. He drives over in his motorcycle to Emma's house and apologizes for dumping her and lists off all the reasons why, how he knows her. Basically, the stuff we saw in the montage from the first meet cute, things like she likes the Rolling Stones, this she likes her so coffee sappy. black. Yeah. It is very sappy. And then by the end, she forgives him and they make out. And I thought that was the end of the episode, but no, they have to leave you on a cliffhanger. So Charlie returns back to the bar. And that's when we find Daphne is actually waiting for them. She's tracked them down. Okay. She knows the money's gone, but she's holding the deaf 
girl up basically by gunpoint and saying, hey, you work for us now. You're getting us that money back. And then that's where the episode See, where, closes out. Where the pilot ends is yeah, much like that. Yeah, he goes to uh, the place he went at the beginning of the episode, the main character. And then, yeah, like uh, the team that he kind of screwed over kind of holds him down. And then we're introduced, I think, to someone who the Daphne character is playing. Mm -hmm. um, it's funny, though, because I know Catherine... Heineken? Yeah, Catherine Heineken. I know that she said that the general premise for this show was the same, but that in terms of, like, the actual, like, episode-to-episode episode thing, it, it's completely different. And it sounds like there's an, enough differences as there is. I was they, surprised... Well, with Catherine Heineken, I kept on thinking that I'd seen her before in something, and I looked through her Wikipedia page, and I couldn't find anything that I would have known her for specifically. Like, she's been in a lot. But I, I just don't know where her face was so familiar. Same with the Daphne lady, a little less so. But uh, I, I also didn't know where I, I knew her from. I know that Milo Ventimiglia, he did a lot with this show. And whenever you're talking about casting, he that's something that he was in charge of. Well, he must have been a fan of Prison Break. I mean, you have Sarah Wayne Callies and William Fitchner there. Yeah, he must have been watching that while he was on Heroes and been like, this is a good show. I was actually surprised to learn. Did you know that after Heroes, he tried to audition for a couple more things and he got so fed up with the process process that he almost quit acting I, okay that just sounds like one of those things that actors say when they're like <laughs> well i know that i know he this is almost like his big show like i think he wanted i think this show was made because he is such a big part of it he bought a lot of people from this is us the production crew over here and he like apparently knows them on a first name basis well you'd think also, so after like what five seasons on this is us but he was practically i mean he's the main character in this show he watches every cut he fields emails in fact sarah wayne Callies even said that whenever he was on set, he was almost like the fucking mayor. <laughs> That's a quote that she said. So get going to your pros. What My pros, pros are the cast one because they, they are really good. Um, the I liked how the show continually tried to pull the rug out from under you. It wasn't good all the time, <laughs> but the fact that it just kept trying, I give it a lot of credit for that. It does do the criminal slash CIA relationship. Like, it, that's the forbidden love that you have because obviously once they find out about each other's jobs, they're going to feel a little awkward. Mm -hmm. um, it, they do that pretty well. I like that setup. And then um, the idea that they also, as a high show, say one big score one more time guys <laughs> like you also have to give it props for that the cons are that they always make these type of shows look way too easy steal from the irish mob easy fake being uh federal agents no problem sneak into a highly elite invitation only gala why not tricks to the same guy so the pastor right mm -hmm. um <laughs> Charlie's character sees him two times within like three hours, once to steal his car, who you'd think he would remember what that guy looked like. And then the second time as the fixer uh, where he's wearing glasses like Clark Kent to just <laughs> to grab the money. Neither time or the second time he does not recognize him, even though the only difference about his face was that he was wearing a man bun. <laughs> which, which was funny because they had referred to him wearing a man bun earlier when he faked being a yoga instructor or something. He um, faked being a yoga instructor? No, when he was talking in the meat cute, she asked him what he did. The first time, he lied and said that he was a yoga okay. instructor. Okay. Right. Uh, and then the other cons are that Emma's introduction, I mentioned this, felt really forced and rushed. Uh, Tina, it seemed like she had been there for a long time. You mentioned that the uh, ex-wife or the wife that left, right? Yeah, that was like within the first 15 minutes that she, she leaves. That she was just like faking at the entire relationship. Basically. This one seems like she would have been around for a while if they would have included her in something this big as the heist huh. the first part and that they would have, yeah, so it just seems odd. And then the last one was the fact that the gala didn't even seem necessary to get the money for the second heist when all they needed to end up doing was text him. Yeah. But yeah, the, the the cast is, I think, the real selling point of the show. It seems like they're all having a really good time. I pointed out the similarity in Kaleidoscope. It's like the Breaking Bad in almost. Laura and Cohen's, yeah. It's like Breaking Bad in the sense that Walter White, he's, he's uh, you know, cooking meth. And then you have Dean, or, or Dean Schrader, right? Yeah. Hank Schrader? Hank Schrader. Schrader. Dean is the name of yeah, the actual yeah, yeah, yeah. actor. Hank, Hank Schrader, yeah. yeah, you know, DEA, and he's part of the same family. It's like, that's kind of a similarity that I thought that you might compare it to. No, because the show's not that good. This is a seven for a network show. I'm not going to continue to watch it, but I can see how it's way better than, say, to me, the pilot of Scorpion was or the Equalizer. <laughs> it still has action. It still does fall into the criminal elements of things, but it also just mixes in the 
everything else. The reviews have been warm to it. I haven't found one that absolutely hates it. All of them say this is not like an amazing show or anything, but The Hollywood Reporter says it remains to be seen if the show The Company You Keep eases into its second episode because it is sustainable. It has a 7.5 on IMDb and 82% on Rotten Tomatoes and then an 83% audience score as well. And like I said, like, you know, every single article seems to be like, yeah, it's, it's, fun for, it's fine for what it is. Yeah, it's just a tad better than your typical show. Not too shabby. Seven for me. Okay. All right. Thanks for listening. We'll see you on the next episode. Hope you enjoyed this one. Bye. Bye.